and it is good to be back with you. Trust you had a great week. Let's continue with the story of King Joshua. But he's coming to an end and we're going to move into King Jehoram, his son. But truly, as we look at this in a little bit more detail, we're actually going to see more of what God is doing with Prophet Isaiah than anything else. Timelines are, are very confusing at this stage between the various books and so just bear with me. And please be very careful in terms of names. Jehoshaphat He's not really king of Judah, but it's for two more years, and we could say that his son Jehoram is really calling the shots. But King Joram, let's use that, King Jehoram, Judah, King Joram is king of Israel from 852 BC to 842 BC. Benedict II still king of Aram and he will be in play until 842 BC. Shalmaneser III is still king of Assyria and he will be in place until 824 BC. Elijah's last prophetic act. He sends this letter to Jehoram, Judah, and he says, God's not pleased with what you do. Remember now, Jehoram is married to Athaliah, Ahab and Jezebel's son. This is God's not pleased with you at all. And in the future, God's going to strike your family and your possessions a serious blow. You will also be afflicted with the bowel disease that will cause your bowel to eventually come out. Really? That's what it says. His bowel will eventually come out. Let's have a look on the map. And if we have a look at the map, here we see Elijah is about to go. Elisha knows that it is the end of Elijah's time period. The people from the school prophets, they also know. They cross the Jordan and Elisha is declaring that he wants a double portion. What is the double portion all about? The firstborn son always received a double portion. Elisha knows that it is actually up to God to give this. But Elisha is saying, I, I, I'm really the son of Elijah. Please give me a double portion of what he had. We know the whole deal. Elisha had to constantly be awake and to make sure he was right there when Elijah disappears. Elijah goes, the fire chariot takes him and the mantle falls to the ground. Elisha picks up the mantle. He has his first test. Comes to the river Jordan and he strikes the river Jordan. The school prophets are standing there and they're looking to see now is it or isn't he? Is he does he have God's power or doesn't he have God's power? And the Jordan River parts. Elisha comes across. God has shown that this man that he has appointed to take the place of Elijah is his and the, God's power is on this man. Now they come across to the town of Jericho and the town of Jericho complains bitterly. They say this, this water is bad, it, it, it is bad. Elisha takes some salt notices he takes some salt and he throws it in the well and in 2 Kings 2 verse 21 it says this is what the Lord says 
I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. This is faith in action. So we start something, we speak the word, we believe in faith. The end result for Elisha in particular is that God honoured Elisha's spoken word. And I believe that God would honour many of our spoken words. The only question is, what is our relationship like with God that He will honour our spoken word? How tight are we? How tight are we? Something we should always be working on. The next thing that happens with Elisha, we find up in Bethel. Bethel, we remember right in the beginning, Jeroboam places this golden calf in Bethel. False worship, idol worship, is still happening in Bethel. Now Elisha is passing through the area, and there's this group of youths, and they come along and they sneer at him and they jeer at him and they, I guess they're really just insulting him. Could it be because this, there was something happening in the spiritual that stirred this up to come against? Again, Elisha speaks a curse upon them. God honors this curse. Two bears come out of the forest and they maul 42 of these youths. They sort them out. Elisha continues and he goes to Carmel. Mount Carmel, exactly what he was doing there, I'm not quite sure. And then he goes off to Samaria. Joram, king of Israel, is in Samaria. He gets hold of King Joshua and let's say King Jehoram, Judah, and he says, I, I need some help in sorting out these Moabites. Won't you please come along and help me in this process? Now remember, we, we really family. It, it, Je, Jehoram and Joram, they're really brother in laws so it's all family, and they agree to this. The idea is, let us go south, around the bottom of the Dead Sea, come in through Edom, and then we can attack Moab. Sensible enough. So even the Edomites joined in this campaign. In a, in a strange way, in, a, in really just a strange way, Elisha is tagging along with this army. What he's doing there, I have no idea, but he's tagging along with him. They come to the desert in Edom and there's no water. They haven't got sufficient supplies and now they are stuck. Jehoshaphat turns around and says, isn't there a prophet somewhere? And everybody wonders, is there, is it? And all of a sudden it pops up, ah, oh, Elisha is here. In this whole discussion, Jehoshaphat knows who Elisha is because he commends Elisha to everybody else. But Elisha wants nothing to do with Jehoram. With wants absolutely nothing. He respects Jehoshaphat and so he agrees to meet. This is what he does. I want a harp, please. Gets a harp. And he sings and he worships God. That's exactly what he does. He sings and he worships God. Now in this place, the hand of God comes upon him. And he gets up and says, Guys, listen. God is saying, dig trenches. Dig all these trenches here. And God will fill these trenches with water flowing out of Edom, 
but without rain. This is really just an easy peasy thing for God to do. He's God after all. He created the weather, he created anything. And then he says, and God says, you will defeat every 45 town in Moab and you will sort Moab out. The next morning they wake up and the water flows from Edom and it fills the trenches. They see this happen, this, this miracle, this water that they need just fills the trenches. But the Moabites on the other side, for them, perhaps it was because of the angle of the sun, who knows, what they do is they're looking and they're saying, hey, look at all these rivers of blood. This army coming against us, they must have just slaughtered each other because there is just a huge amount of blood in these trenches in them. And they head out now to the sea because they want to go and collect all the plunder. And as they're coming along, so the, this combined Israel, Judah, Edom army, they meet them face to face and they slaughter the Moabites out there in the desert. The king of Moab, he runs. And as this army goes through, they smash down all the fortified towns. And eventually they come to a town where the king of Moab is in. The whole town is surrounded by this army. What does the king do? Who is their God? Now, step back. King Solomon built a temple to this God particularly on the hill opposite Jerusalem. This is the God Chemosh, the God of sacrifice in the fire. The king, on top of the wall, what he does is he sacrifices his son to this God. One of two things could have happened. The first, that this combined army was just so absolutely disgusted that he would do this at their back up and leave. Or two, they were scared because now he has evoked this God, Chemosh, into action. And now they are scared and they pack up and leave. We don't know. Other way around, they go home. Time now, 850 BC. It's the end of Jehoshaphat. Chronicles has portrays this, this very mm, beautiful picture of King Jehoshaphat, showing how close he was to God, that he got rid of idols and that he convinced the people of the land to turn back to God. It tells us that he even appointed judges throughout the land. And in 2 Chronicles 19 from verse 6 to 7, it has this to say about the issue of appointing the judges. Consider carefully what you do speaking to the judges because you are not judging for man but for the Lord for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery isn't that profound it is so profound if only that was true today if only this was very true that the judicial system in the countries did what they were supposed to do without bribery and corruption. But alas, we all know it not to be the case. Jehoshaphat also records that he gave instructions to the priests and really the instructions carried this. You are to warn the people of Jerusalem not to sin. He set up the priesthood. He set up a sort of prime minister governance type of system. And many of the Levites acted as officials in his government. Again, a wisdom statement 
2 Chronicles 19 verse 11 Act with courage and may the Lord be with those who do well. Simple. You officials were to act with courage and if you do your job well, he is pronouncing a blessing on them. May you be well rewarded. The Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote many books and in this particular book, The Antiquities of the Jews, book 9, he writes, he, referring to Joshua, was buried in a magnificent manner in Jerusalem, for he had imitated the actions of David. So what has changed on the maps? Well, really, Israel has regained lost territory. Again, that place, Ramath Gilead, we can see how it's now changed and falls back under Israel. Overall, what has Jehoram done in Judah? During his time period, he has simply introduced Baal worship. Specify this, his wife is Queen Athalia. She is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, Jezebel was the lady that introduced Baal worship into Israel. And it is for this reason that Elijah had sent him that letter saying that God is not well pleased with you. I now begin to wonder all the priests and the whole priestly system that Jehoshaphat had put in place, what has happened to them? What, what are they doing? It doesn't seem like they're coming against this ball of worship. So what are they doing? Let's go and have a look at Elisha. What is happening with Elisha? One of the wives sends a note through to Elisha. Her husband was part of the school company of prophets and he's passed away and she sends a note saying, please help. The debtors are knocking at our door. They want to now take our children to sell them as slaves to settle the debt that my husband made. Elisha arrives, has a look at what she's got and he says, go and get empty jobs. From all your neighbors bring them and with that little bit of oil that you've got you fill those jars you will then sell all those jars of oil and there will be enough funds for you to settle the debt again spoken word elisha is anointed by god the power is upon elisha god honors his spoken word Israel is seemingly at peace. Judah is not. Why is Judah not at peace? Remember the words that Elijah had sent to Jehoram saying, Trouble's coming your way. Things are coming your way. You're going to lose your finances. Things are coming your way. And now Edom comes against Judah. Jehoram is defeated. And he flees for his life. He loses control of the copper mines in Edom. The east-west trade routes, they're gone. And the Levites in a town called Libna, they, they, they revolt. Why? I guess because for them it is just repulsive that Jehoram was such a good king and his son, sorry, Jehoshaphat, was such a good king, and our son, Jehoram, is such a bad king. So this town revolts. We see in 2 Chronicles 21 verse 10, it simply says, this all happened because Jehoram had forsaken the Lord, the God of his fathers. Silly boy, 
silly man. Let's go and have a look at what's happening with Elisha. Elisha is in Israel. He goes to a place called Shunem. And in Shunem, this is probably, he was passing on his way through to Mount Carmel. And in Shunem, he meets up with this wealthy couple. There's a meal at their house, develops his friendship, and every single time he passes through, he stops there for a meal. Eventually, the couple decide, why don't we actually build a room for him? So when he comes through, he, they, there's a room ready for him. They build this room, and they set it up for him. Somewhere during this process, Elisha says to the lady, in one year's time, you will have a child. Again, prophetic words spoken. Anointing of God is upon this man. God honors the prophetic word. She has a child in one year's time. Let's jump. This child is now old enough to speak. We know this because the child is, is not feeling well and runs out into the field and says to the father, I, I'm not feeling well, I'm not feeling well. And effectively, he dies. She knows who the man of God is. That's Elisha. She goes after Elisha. Elisha is at Mount Carmel with his servant Gehazi. God tells him, she's coming. She arrives, gets the other story, and he sends Gehazi along with his staff and he said, just play this, this staff on the boy's face. Gehazi must have thought, well, the boy will come back to life because I'm, I'm his servant and it's all going to happen and God said this. He comes back to Elisha and Elisha's coming through with this lady and they're still on the way to walk and he says, but nothing happened, the end result. Elisha's not phased. He goes in and he lies on top of the boy. But here is something quite different. Elisha does not declare that the boy is dead. In fact, he asks God to rather restore the boy to health. Really? You need to check this out. It's in 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 32 to 37. And he lays on top of the boy. God honors it and the boy's health is restored. He comes back to life. Elisha again, prophetic word spoken. He says, I recommend you go away because a drought is now coming upon this land. We don't quite know how long this drought lasted for, but she comes back seven years later. And it just so happens that Gehazi is busy speaking to King Joram about Elisha restoring her son back to life, and she walks into the royal court. Joram is so amazed at this coincidence, and he's, well, what are you doing here? So, well, I'm, I'm coming back. I went away because of the drought, as you know, and, I, and I'm coming back and I would like my land. He orders that her land be restored to her, plus all the proceeds from the land over the seven years be restored to her as well. All the income be given to her. The grace and the compassion of God Almighty. We pick up another story of Elisha. Elisha is at Gilgal. This is where the story of the, the pot of stew goes horribly wrong and now there's poison in, in the pot of stew. Again, Elisha speaks, God honors, and the food is fixed. It was a faith action that happened. God honors. I and mean, everything happens. We also pick up the very first incident of a crowd of people being miraculously fed. This also happens at Gilgal. There's over a hundred men gathered there and they get 20 loaves delivered to them 
and Elisha says to, to a servant saying, Buddy, hand this food out to everybody here. But the servant that says, but there's not enough. There's not enough for everybody. <laughs> Elisha knows this. Elisha knows full well this. But he wants to show the might and the power of God is in the doing. We pick this up in 2 Kings 4 verse 43. For this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. A little bit further. According to the word of the Lord. So there was plenty to go around. We can say this is the first miraculous feed of a group of people with not enough food. So what's happening in Aaron? Ben the II, he is slowly but surely busy restoring his army. And there's a chap by the name of Naaman, who is his army commander. We know the story. In short, Naaman picks up leprosy. Somebody in his household from a servant girl that was captured. The word gets through, but there is this prophet in Israel through which you can get healed. He's willing to pay. Naaman is willing to pay. He takes 70 kilograms of gold and 340 kilograms of silver. We know the story. Comes to Elisha. Servant goes out and says, My he says you must go and wash in the Jordan. I he gets upset and eventually gets convinced and he goes and does this and he is cured of leprosy. Comes back to Elisha and Elisha says, It's okay. It's okay. You now know who God is. But he makes an interesting comment and he says, Will you please forgive me? When God sees me go into the temple with my master Ben Adam II, to go and worship those gods. Will he forgive you? Elisha grants it and says, yes, God will forgive you. In any case, Naaman takes soil from, from outside of Elisha's house with him. Gehazi cannot believe this. Man, do you know how wealthy this would have made us? 70 kilograms of gold and 300 odd kilograms of silver would have made us very wealthy. He chases after Naaman and says, stop, 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 sorry, 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 Zay. Okay, what is the problem? No, there's been a slight misunderstanding. And actually what was meant is that you are meant to actually pay that because then we can, the shorter the story, Gehazi lies. Elisha knows he's lying. And Gehazi now gets inflicted with leprosy himself. Judah is now at peace and the Arameans attack Israel. Here is God at work again. God, Elisha, goes and tells Joram, king of Israel, where these guys are going to set up camp. And then Joram attacks. Ben had dead. He, he's now with his commanders. He, he just he, he's confused. How is this possible that that we plan to go there and and the Israelite army is there and just smacks us around a little bit? And he has this chat with his generals and things. And I believe it could well be known. He says to Ben Adam the second, Ha! Huh? But the Lord God is on their side. And in fact, the Lord God tells the king of Israel, even what you say in your sleep. And that is how they know. Benadab said, you, you go and get that prophet. That, that prophet, you go and get him. So again, they send out this vast army to go and capture Elisha. Elisha and people come out the house in the morning and they see this vast army and, and the people are scared. 
But Elisha sees in the spiritual. He sees in the spiritual. And he has the following to say. We see it in 2 Kings 6 verse 16. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. For in the spiritual, he sees around the mountain tops all these chariots of fire that God sends. The short of the story is that the Arameans come to get him and he asks that they all be blinded. All be blinded and he leads them into the city of Samaria. The people in Samaria cannot believe their eyes. Look at this army coming in. And Elisha says, don't worry, they're not going to harm you. In fact, you're going to feed them, give them a good meal. And he asks God to give them vision. This whole army, they find themselves in Samaria and they enjoy a hearty meal. They leave and there's an element of peace that comes about. But later on, the Arameans come back again to attack Samaria. They surround Samaria and it gets so bad that the parents in the city begin to eat their children. That is how bad things get. Joram, he blames God. He looks at Elisha and he says, you are like the representative of God, so therefore if we kill you, then this problem can be resolved. <laughs> How utterly ridiculous. Elisha is warned by God. The troops are coming to get him in, in the house because he's in Samaria. And God says, don't let them open the door. Because effectively, I've changed Joram's heart and his mind, and you're not going to be put to death anymore. But you can't let them in because Joram's running across to stop this whole thing from happening. Now, Elisha speaks a prophetic word, and he says, by this time tomorrow evening, there will be plenty of food. The Arameans will be gone and there will be plenty of food for everybody to eat. Short story, long story short, God intervenes yet again. The Arameans during the night, they hear what sounds like uh, thousands of chariots coming at them. They just drop their things and they flee. So when the city wakes up in the morning, the Arameans are gone. They're simply gone. All this food that they left behind, all this plunder that they left behind, it's all for them. Again, God honored the spoken word. What's happening in Judah? The Philistines and the Arabs attack Judah. Come through the palace, they take a huge amount of possessions. Remember the prophetic word that Elijah gave that everything of this nature is going to happen. They take these positions, they take his wives, his sons, but one son is left. That's Ahaziah. Only son that's left. This is all in line with the prophetic word that was spoken. Jehoram gets afflicted with a bowel disease. It takes two years. Bell comes out and he dies. Ahaziah becomes king of Judah. That's where we end this particular episode. Just stay a little bit longer. Graphic will pop up giving you details of my website and blog site to which you can go and visit. Have a great week.